Gautier, and he will be talking about one of the most exciting and hot areas in big data these days, which is deep learning. Yeah. <laughs> Hi. <laughs> um, so I'm Gautier Bertou. I'm a researcher at the Swedish Institute of Computer Science. Um, I was supposed to do the presentation with Jim Doling, but he couldn't come here today. Um, so what I will speak about is uh, deep learning on how uh, the platform we are developing can help people to start with deep learning. Um, because the thing is that uh, my team uh, at the Swedish Institute of Computer Science and we have created a startup and we are, what we are doing is developing a new um, Hadoop distribution. Uh, it's the first European Hadoop distribution. And some aspect of it can be very useful for uh, starting with deep learning. So to start with, uh, raise a question, uh, what are the factors that hold back artificial intelligence today? Uh, if we look at Bender, we can think that it's alcohol and sex, but <laughs> according to Andre Kapati, I don't exactly know how you pronounce his name. If you don't know him, he is working at uh, OpenAI, he, and his blog is a quite influential blog in deep learning. So this uh, citation is taken from his blog, and he says that there is four factors that hold back uh, artificial intelligence. First one is the compute, it's the compute power we have. So this is hardware, this is how much machine you have, uh, how powerful are your GPU, CPU, and things like that. Uh, the second one is the data, is that to do deep learning, you, do, you need big data. You need big data that are clean, that are, and right now it's not so easy to find them. The data are kind of all over the place on the internet, don't really know where to find them, then you, when you find some data, you don't know if they are really clean, and things like that. Um, then the third component is algorithm. So it's what you will do if you work on, uh, if you want to develop new artificial intelligence system. And the last one is infrastructure, is what do you run um, your deep learning system on? So it's the, the operating system, but also where you store your data and things like that. And what our platform uh, address, the problem that our platform address is uh, the data problem and the infrastructure problem. So we'll start with the data problem. Um, so the data challenge, how do you find good and interesting data? Okay, if you are in a big company, you are Spotify, or you have the data that are there and you can use them. But if you are a hacker or a researcher or you want to experiment with uh, data, you don't necessarily have them there and you look for them. And then it's, right now it's kind of going to IKEA but going directly to the last part. You have data all over the place, they are all in box, you have to find the box that go together, you have to bring that out at home by yourself. And then you build it, and then you find out that, oh, it's not what I wanted. <laughs> so, so how can we help with that? Uh, yeah, and then the other problem, are, as I say, you bring it back home. How do you do that right now? Is that we don't see, but it's not so important. It's a line of code that tells you how to download some data from, uh, from S3. And most of the time you have to run it 100 times to have all the data. And if one of them crash in the middle, you have to do it manually to find out. Uh, we had the student, a PhD student, downloading um, uh, weather data. Um, and it took him one week the first time. And then he re-implemented uh, the client to download the data and it went a lot faster. But, and then it's, if you have data and you want to make them public, how do you do that? There is no straightforward solution, no. You can, okay, you can put them uh, on Amazon or on Google Cloud, but then who pay for that? Who pay for um, each time someone downloads? And uh, then you have to make some web page to publish them and things like that. There is, 
no very nice platform where in few clicks you can say, okay, now my data are public. And this is what, um, this is one of the things we do in our platform. Uh, I wanted to make a, a demo, uh, but the problem is that uh, for uh, I can't connect my uh, computer <laughs> to the video projector and uh, the demo, uh, so I will describe the demo and show some screenshot. Because the demo is, is running, we have uh, deployed two virtual machines uh, in my lab. Uh, and uh, I need my computer to access to them because of firewall problem. Uh, but so the idea is that we had two virtual machines with a full uh, stack, with uh, the hop stack, so which contain, uh, we store the data in HDFS and then use uh, yarn and, and things like that. Uh, so it's a full Hadoop stack and we have data in there and we want to share them. And we have a nice um, interface to, to see your data in the in the HDFS. Uh, I will show it a little more when I speak over the infrastructure, but we have data in one of the virt virtual machines. Um, and what we do is just we right click on them and say share this data. Here there is a share the data. And then this data are now public. And they have a description, which is a file, a readme file that is in the, in the folder and that describe what are in the data. And then we, on the other virtual machine, we can search for the name of this data or for something in the description. We use Elastic Search for the research. And we will find the, we will get the result there of all the, the public data sets that are there. And we will say, okay, download it. And yeah, the screenshots are very bad. <laughs> uh, when we download it, we say to which project we want to add them. And then if it's uh, HDFS, we can directly dump it to HDFS. Or if it's stuff that have the good format for Kafka, we can also put them in Kafka. And once we have done that, it starts downloading and we can uh, start processing on them. How does it work in the back in the background? It's uh, it's a peer-to-peer -peer, uh, torrent-like uh, protocol. So if a lot of people have this data set in their cluster, then it will go faster to download them. Um, and then uh, we use the lebdat for the lebdat for the <coughs> transport protocol. The idea is that uh, lebdat it is non-obtrusive. So we know that uh, if you have data sets that are public, it may not be your priority to upload them to people that want to download them. Your priority is to serve the people that use your uh, cluster directly. So let that is good for that because it will use only the, uh, the bandwidth that is not used by TCP. And so if people are not using your cluster, it will be able to upload at maximum speed. But as soon as you have TCP connections that start to use your cluster, it will go down and use less bandwidth. The other uh, interest of uh, LabDAT is that it works a lot better than, uh, than TCP over high latency, high bandwidth uh, connection. Uh, which are the connection you have when you have cluster on both sides of the Atlantic or things like that. Um, I had numbers, but um, because the problem with TCP is that uh, the congestion windows is badly reacted to high latency and so when the latency increase the, con the throughput at which TCP can transmit over the network is going down. LabDAT is, uh, <coughs> is measuring the latency and is looking at the change in latency to know if it should decrease or increase uh, the throughput at which it's on. Um, so. And this has also the advantage that it's under better packet loss because it will not take a packet loss as, okay, now I need to decrease the size of my windows by half. It will say, okay, there is one packet that was lost, but globally the latency is the same. So maybe it was just this packet, which can happen on a very long link. And uh, lastly, we download the, the piece uh, in order so you can start to process what you are downloading while it's downloading. 
Mm. So now for the infrastructure part. So if you if you want to develop artificial intelligence and you want to be to do the artificial intelligence algorithm and stuff like that, you don't necessarily want to deal with all the infrastructure under that. You don't want to be this guy. And um, for that, uh, we propose to use a TensorFlow and Hadoop. So why TensorFlow? Uh, if you were there uh, two presentations ago, it was two or three. <laughs> Uh, you saw that there is a lot of uh, existing uh, system to do uh, deep learning. Uh, we choose TensorFlow because it's the big one right now. It's the one uh, everybody uses. It's Google behind it, so I guess it's help. Uh, I'm personally more developing the Hadoop part, so I don't know so much about TensorFlow. <laughs> I'm sorry about that. Um, and then we think that Hadoop is, a, is good for because you want to have big data, as I said at the beginning. Uh, the data you need to train. Your data flow on Hadoop is not so good. It's, uh, the reason is that the way people do it is that they have the data in Hadoop, they have TensorFlow on another machine, and they take the data to where TensorFlow is, they run TensorFlow, they, they run their uh, algorithm, and then they put back the result in Hadoop. This is not efficient. Uh, luckily, um, they have been, uh, now it has been developed a system so that you can, from TensorFlow, use data that are in Hadoop, and in our platform, we have integrated all of this together so that uh, people can directly run uh, their TensorFlow job uh, in the plane on using data in Hadoop without having all to do all this transfer. Uh, it's not perfect yet. Uh, there is still a lot of work to do. Uh, and this will be part of our future work. Uh, so I will just do a quick... Um, Demo of our system, the resolution will be shit. So, uh, we, um, or will I? <laughs> uh, so the thing is that uh, we we run this platform. Um, <coughs> hmm? Um, okay. <laughs> so the thing is that we have a data center uh, in Luleå in the north of Sweden. Um, the same place where Hadoop have their, uh, where Facebook has their European data center. Uh, I guess it's... Ah, I just want to zoom out. <laughs> Okay. Oops. Um, mm. <laughs> I'm lost. Um, yeah, it's English. Yeah, but I use the Swedish one. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> okay, so so the idea is that we have a front end for uh, our Hadoop system, um, and uh, we have a project uh, system where everything in Hadoop is a project. On pro inside projects, you have uh, users that have different role and we ensure isolation between the project. So if you have data in Hadoop and they are part of a project, you know that people that are not part of this project can't access to it. And then uh, we can uh, go to SpaceNet. Uh, it's, uh, so on this data center, we give access to our student 
the, of the deep learning course and they did their um, their homework on, on it and one of the group did uh, the spa SpaceNet uh, challenge so it's um, uh, the idea on yeah again and they run it on the cluster they just went to Zeppelin uh, and in Zeppelin yeah, it's uh, creating notebook on the idea of SpaceNet is that it's a satellite picture of um, uh, so these are the notebooks this is all TensorFlow codes uh, and there's some picture so it's some satellite picture uh, of the Rio area and the goal is to recognize if there is building in the picture and you can see that when there is building it's isolate the part where the building are I went too fast. So, yeah. So as you can see with this platform, uh, it's easy to download new uh, data set and to start working on them with Zeppelin. Um, <laughs> Sticking thing. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um. <laughs> Come on. <laughs> okay. <laughs> uh, so future work. I only wrote the future work concerning TensorFlow because it's the only part I spoke about uh, for platform. So something we are working on right now is a distributed TensorFlow. So this exists, but this is the, we don't think that the implementation is so good right now, and it's not uh, it doesn't work on Yarn. On the as we want to run it on top of Hadoop, we want to run it on top of Yarn. So we have some people working on that, uh, making that you can r you will be able in the future to say, okay, I want a cluster with these machines and I want to run this TensorFlow program on it and then Yarn should take care of, of that. Um, then that means also adding some uh, thing to Yarn because we want to be able uh, to run with Infidimon on GPUs uh, which Yarn uh, doesn't handle right now. Right now Yarn only handles CPU and memory. So we, will, uh, we, are, we are also working on adding this information into Yarn. Um, so as I was saying, we have a cluster up in Luleo. Uh, it's already used, so it's code that has, that are, uh, I have no idea. Uh, that is in production that uh, student and researcher are using. Uh, if you want to test or code uh, or platform, you can uh, either go to uh, hops.io. And then you, you have a Vagrant, uh, you can deploy the full tag with Vagrant and start to play with it. Um, we can also give you access to a cluster uh, in Luleo, but you won't have access to the GPU cards because we don't have enough, so we keep them for ourselves. Um, then I just want to thank all these people. Uh, so we have a lot of alumni because uh, we are a research uh, people so it's a lot of students that have been working with us and that have done a valuable work but as you see we are quite a small team working on this project and uh, we we created a startup to develop it it's called logical clocks um, and then uh, we are looking for people that want to either use our, our system and give us feedback or develop it, it's all open so you can go on github or ops.io and have more information about us. Thanks. <laughs> Questions?
Any questions? Well, thank you so much again. <laughs>